Okay, so now the clock turned for me 12 sets. So I'm going to start the webinar for from today. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. I hope you're all doing great this Thursday. Uh, my name is Sofia Svanbeck and I'm going to be your host today. Uh, my awesome colleague from the uh, 42 Sweden, Giuseppe De Simone, is going to present today. And he's going to talk about the building blocks for organization. So really happy to see some are still uh, dropping in uh, and we can just start. So uh, some of you are maybe familiar to the Organic Agility webinars already. This is now the second part of a series that we are keeping. Uh, the first uh, one was kept in March by our colleague Laste, and this is now the continuing uh, part number two. And the third part is now uh, set for May 22nd. Uh, it's not published yet, so stay tuned uh, for more information about that. For example, on the meetup groups, social media, or um, on the website. Small practicalities about how we want to work with you today. Uh, we really, really want you to be interactive with us. So feel free to use the chat for anything, any comments or, or other things you want to let us know. Make sure that you're writing to all panelists and attendees so that the, everyone can see what you are sharing. Uh, throughout the webinar, you might have questions. So please use the Q&A for it. And in the end of the webinar, we will be going through the questions with you. Um, this is going to be a recording, so uh, the webinar will be published later on on our website and also in the post email that you will be getting from us after the webinar, you will find the links. So you can share this with friends and colleagues or even watch it again if you like to. Uh, there will in the post email also be a little bit more details uh, about links and stuff that we are mentioning today. So feel free uh, to respond also to the email if you have anything uh, you want to ask or something is unclear. I'm not going to keep you uh, waiting for Giuseppe's uh, nice talk, so I'm giving it over to him right now. See you later. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to share this, uh, what would be probably half an hour conversation with you, and after that we will leave some space for, for questions and answers. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask you, um, uh, yeah, a, a question, and we're going to use the 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 Q and A since we the, the, the poll is disabled here. Uh, just I want to to you to answer in the chat. Okay, which of you participated to the previous webinar? Um, just just to have an idea about how many of you had uh, had attended that. Um, feel free to share in your, your chat, um, in, the, in the, the chat about that. So I see like, um, okay, it looks like no one attended the first webinar. Oh, just one person. Yeah, a few of you. So, so, so thanks for the, for the answers. I mean, this uh, is, is kind of uh, telling me that we should probably you know, say a few words about um, the previous webinar, like make a recap before we move into that. But, but let's get started anyway. Um, I want to start by, by telling a story. Um, yeah, and by the way, I think it would be a good idea that I switch off my video so that you don't get disturbed and you can see the full slides and you should get disturbed by this nice flip chart that you see in, uh, in the background. So I'm gonna stop my video now and start it again when we do the question and answer. So um, I want to share a story and this story is about my son. Uh, he's uh, passionate about animals and he's passionate about science and he would like to start uh, like zoology, animal science in, uh, at university. And his dream is to um, like participate to some rescue projects of, of uh, animals in danger of, of extinction. And um, he, we had some discussion about the DNA some weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and then he said that, you know, sometimes there are mutations in the, in, the, in the DNA and uh, there are some, some um, animals that are at risk of extinction because of, of changes in the environment. And sometimes this might be like also 
uh, good for, for the whole ecosystem, right? And they explain me that some of this mutation, mutation happen in our organism all the time. Like we probably, you know, in these days, uh, it's all about understanding RNA, the virus and so on. But some of the mutation that happens in the DNA uh, cause no harm. Some are helpful because they helps in the evolution, some causes diseases, right? And, and all mutations are determined as responses to changing circumstances. So I was thinking about like, you know, if, if organization and company are also kind of organism, and uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we are triggered by change, but what are these changes? I mean, what are, how the company change skin and, and mutate uh, in order to respond to changing circumstances? What are these changing circumstances? I mean, and we can say there are two kinds of things. I mean, uh, two kinds of triggers. I mean, there are, first of all, outside in triggers, right? And, um, and I want to, to, to show you that, um, to talk about, for instance, I mean, this curve. I mean, probably all of you know um, this uh, curve of diffusion, diffusion of innovation from Everett, Roge, Everett Rogers that then Jeffrey Moore completed uh, by explaining that, you know, in the, in the life cycle of a, of a market, uh, of course, we go through the, this different kind of, of, uh, of uh, customers, typology, but there is a, a shift between early adopters and early majority, uh, and there is a chasm. So, so if the company wants to, to move to, to sell to an early majority, uh, they have to, to shift their strategy dramatically from a sell to make strategy where you try to sell your your vision to customer, uh, and then you, 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 you sell enough to, to be able then to produce to a make to sell when the focus should be on quality performance of speed, right? And, and the big change is that this market cycle line that used to be before like between 15 and 30 years, now is shrinked very much from five to seven years. And that this creates a, a, a big problem. And the first problem is that, <clears throat> you know, usually in the past companies were, used to, to reorganize, to adapt this shift in the market. And, you know, having a market cycle length, the market's life cycle of 15, 30 years, you know, company, you have the possibility to reorganize, to structure the processes in order to adapt to different customer types, and especially to shift from, from focus on effectiveness to focus on efficiency. But now that the, 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 the cycle is shrinked to, to five to seven years, you know, if you want to use the same, uh, way of adapting by reorganizing and restructuring that it's creating a lot of, of, of stress and fatigue. And we see many companies are having reorganization every 12 months, sometimes even every six months. And that's created a lot of disruption in the, in the, in the companies. And there is, a, so there must be a, a better way to adapt to, to, to this faster change. Another problem is that if you are uh, on, the, on the peak of the, of the market where the market print of the, of this curve where the market penetration is 50% and you dominate the market, probably you dominate the market um, according to the apex, apex dominant theory from Dave Snowden, because you are very much adapted to their circumstances. It means that you are very much adapted to focus on quality, performance, on speed, on efficiency of processes. And then uh, how can, can a company that is optimized to this can maybe start a new curve and start to innovate again? And that's also another big problem that company has. So another big question is that how we can, uh, you know, be optimized on performance and speed in some market uh, or for some product, and then, you know, maybe start to innovate to penetrate new market. So that's the first trigger. And that's something that would require a change in the DNA of a company. But let's look up also some inside out triggers, right? And we're looking at what is called the, the the pyramidal results. So if a, if a company, you know, normally have a vision and then actually you can achieve that vision by setting some, some, some goals, right? And the way to achieve the goals is through the results that every person in the company achieve. But these results are of course triggered by the actions and behaviors of, of, of the people in that company or that organization. So, um, However, there is something more than that because the action of a people are triggered by people beliefs, which by the way are shaped by the experience that people live. I mean, our brain is a connecting machine. So 
you know, what we are are shaped by the experience we, we, we live since our childhood. And of course, the experience we live in our companies and that create a wise, uh, wide frames in our brain that help us interpret the reality and decide what is right or what is wrong. So traditional companies uh, have been able to manage actions and result to be able to achieve a vision, right? And, and they try to manage action and result by creating alignment on the structure, alignment on tools, processes, roles, responsibility. And this is something that works pretty well in a pretty stable environment where something is not volatile. But, you know, in a very uh, fast changing environment, you know, how can we imagine to, to manage, you know, people action? Like if you over constrained system, we all have probably experience of that. Uh, if you over constrain a system that people are starting gaming the system. So, uh, and we cannot uh, assume that one person can control everything, but the, the decision making and the actions and should be distributed uh, and delegated to those that are closer to the problem. But on the other side, how can you uh, ensure that in this case, you know, not everybody is going uh, in, in different direction. So the way to do would be actually to create uh, coherence on the lower part of, of, the, of this pyramid. First, because this give, give us a much uh, more powerful leverage, uh, but also because you, you can create autonomy by creating cultural coherence. And you create cultural coherence by creating ritual, storytelling, and uh, as we will see later, proper leadership behavior, okay? so. This was just a little bit to sum up what my colleague Lasse spoke about in the last webinar. So I have a question for you. I would like you to answer, I'll give you a couple of minutes reflection by using again the chat. Think about your organization. What do you think would be required to your organization to move from a process alignment, which is the top part of the, the pyramid, managing actions and results, to more cultural coherence? meaning like uh, leading on the beliefs and experience level. I will give you a couple of minutes. I'm interested to, to look at your, to, 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 to see your thoughts. Okay, leadership mindset change. That's the first section. Thanks a lot. Educating leadership. It starts with leadership, empowerment and mindset change. Metrically self-reflecting outcome. Transparency. Changing leadership again, time and focus on what is important. Yeah, I think you, you, you guys trust someone else. Conversation, very good. I think you are all on spot of this and I will probably explain you better uh, why moving forward. But I would like to, to claim that there is one thing that probably is the most important thing, which conglobates all of your reflections that we probably, we need to shift the metaphor about how we describe our organization. Because if we change the metaphor about how we describe organization, a new world of possibility will, will open up in front of us. And, and, and so, so far, you know, our organization has been described as a machine. You know, this was due to scientific management theory. So we consider our organization as machines that, that, that are consisted of a set of, processes, uh, tools, uh, roles, and uh, responsibility. And then we assume that we uh, put some uh, end, uh, like system request into, into the, 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 the system. And then by having a mechanical and very uh, like smooth uh, functioning of all these uh, thousands of processes and tools, then we come up with something that is valuable for, the, for, for our customers. And we also think that, you know, people are cogs, are resources that can be replaced uh, very easily. And then, uh, you know, uh, possibly if something is wrong and we need to change, 
Then we just uh, restructure the machine and we reorganize the process here, we reorganize the tool and we replace some cogs with something else uh, and so on. You know, personally, it never happened, this never happened to me. But if we think about our organization, a living organism, then probably this, that have their own life and where the different part of the system uh, have their own autonomy and their own lives and, and the system is more defined by the relationship between the different agents in the system, that probably opens up much, much many more possibility. And we also understand that, for instance, we cannot force change on this kind of, 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 of system. And already Peter Drucker used to say that you can take a, a, a herd of bisons wherever you want as, as long as they want to, right? And, um, and we also understand that you know, probably uh, this kind of, of, of uh, organism cannot be led through process and tools, but must be led through principles uh, because that having an, um, a coherence around principles and values will allow these different ages in the system uh, to, to take their own decision, but still be coherent with each other, coherent with, uh, with the vision. And um, already, you know, W.E. Deming used to say that, you know, don't copy the tool, copy the principles, right? And, and this is something that it's, it's very much understood uh, by, by um, you know, decades. And still, uh, you know, companies believe that, you know, they can copy paste from others. If you have experience about agile transition, it's everything about implementing that framework more than another framework and so on. And it's not about, you know, uh, understanding the values and principles create a coherence of behaviors around those principles that will then, you know, given the context, will, will create the right practices. And that's the reason why um, um, that's the reason why we, we propose organic agility not as a method, not as a process, but as, as a, an eye level approach. Uh, and organic, it's not only a metaphor, but it's also um, um, uh, an acronym that is organization resilience is achieved by growing autonomy and nurturing an interdependent culture. And by uh, understanding a little bit more, you can also understand the, why this, this um, acronym. And, and that's why, you know, organic agility is more like presented as, as a scaffolding, you know, to allow companies not to push um, one side free tall uh, framework, but uh, proposing, offering a scaffolding to allow companies to de develop their own practices. And the scaffolding is the, formed by a leadership framework, which will be uh, the subject of the next webinar, a set of five principles, as we said, we want to get coherence around principles, not, not alignment around processes, because that's only, um, you know, offer robustness, but not resilience. And then each of these principles is, uh, is um, con contains a number of tools that a, a company that doesn't know where to start can grasp on uh, in order to then um, create their own practices. And, um, Today we're going to uh, have an overview of the five principles and then the upcoming uh, webinars after the, the third uh, are going to do, uh, go a, a little bit more dive into each and every principles and present the different tools that are, that are um, you know, contained, uh, that are uh, coupled to with each principle. Uh, and of course, you know, this is just uh, to give you an overview. And then, you know, as, as, um, as Sophia will explain you at the beginning, there is a lot of education about this. And for instance, we have two days uh, foundation class uh, that goes deeper into, into all these aspects. But let's try to have a look at the principles. And you see, these are proposed as a scaffolding, something that allows the company to build their own building according to their own context. And then when, when things are, are, are um, when the building is complete, and then of course you can also remove, you can also remove the scaffolding, right? Um, so, yeah, 
So let's have a look at the principle number one. The first principle is about increased cultural awareness and coherence. What does it mean? I mean, uh, we said before we want to get, get uh, um, uh, like coherence around um, uh, values and beliefs. That's what, 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 what does it mean? How it, this, can, this, this can be achieved? And um, I want to, to introduce to a, a framework that we use, which is called competence value frameworks. So it's, it's a lot of, um, there are a lot of, of um, models around um, making culture explicit, but we believe that this one is the one that is more corroborated by, by research. Um, and this starts with a research in the 70s about, uh, you know, what are some, some uh, parameters that, that uh, or key success factors for, for companies to be successful. And they, uh, these two researchers, Cameron and Queen, came up with 38 parameters after research in the 70s. But since you cannot do so much with, with 38 parameters, they put these parameters under statistical analysis and they came up with, with four different ar cultural archetypes uh, around this, this dimension that you see in, your, in, this, uh, in this picture. And, um, and this provides a way to visualize uh, culture. So let's have a look very quickly at, at these four archetypes. So on the bottom left corner, you have a kind of cultural archetypes, which is very much internal focused and very much, you know, uh, valuing centralization. The, the key word of this kind of culture is called control, right? It's also called hierarchy. And, uh, and uh, the, the key word uh, or the mantra for this kind of people having this kind of culture is doing things right. Of course, this is an archetype, so we will see no culture is, is, a, is, a, is a specifically on, on, on identical to an archetype, but usually the culture of a company is a combination of different culture. But typical culture uh, that is very much skewed towards the control is uh, the culture, for instance, of, of, a, of a big bank or insurance company or, or companies that are very much operating in a highly regulated environment. Then on the other side, on the opposite side, you have a, a, a kind of culture that is very much externally focused and very much looking for diversity. And the key word is create. So this is typical uh, culture of a, of a uh, startup maybe. And, and the, the, the mantra of this kind of culture is doing things uh, first, right? Of course, you can understand why this is called competing values framework because these two archetypes that are opposite to each other they are competing with each other because doing in th things first and doing things right they are in a way like in a tension within each other right and of course each of these cultures as a, as a kind of leadership as a, as a good attitude but also uh, a little bit of, of uh, fallbacks or of drawbacks sorry now let's have a look at the other two kind of cultures so on the on the top uh, right corner, we have a kind of culture that is internally focused and is very much uh, value diversity. And the, the key word is collaborate. And the, the, the mantra for this kind of people having I mean, this culture is doing things together. So there's a lot of, of focus on collaboration, a lot of focus on human development, a lot of focus on coaching, mentoring, and so on. On the other side, you have a kind of culture that is fo externally focused and, and very much um, centralized which is called compete, right? And the, the mantra of this kind of culture is doing things fast. And of course, compete and collaborate are um, in tension with each other because doing things fast and doing things together don't go very much um, together. And this is a kind of culture where there's a lot of focus on internal competition and uh, you know, willingness to win over customer, win over colleagues, win over competition and so on. So as I said, this gives for archetypes. And then, uh, you know, usually the way you can visualize uh, an organizational culture would be like a, a profile, which is a combination of, of all of this. Um, and, um, and, and creating awareness, and I will show you what is the tool that organic agility provides to visualize the culture. Creating awareness of what your culture is, is definitely the first step for, for, a, for, a, for a change. Or, or the first step to understand, is our culture coherence? Is our culture coherent with our uh, business goal? Is, for instance, our culture coherent with the market life cycle where we are in? Because probably you can, you can um, uh, immediately understand that probably 
uh, different uh, life cycle in the in the sorry different phases in the market life cycle can require uh, a different kind of, of, of culture shape and actually since the culture is how we do things around and it is the dna of the company then if you just you know uh, uh, adapt the, the 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 visible part like the process and tools but don't adapt the dna there is no way you can survive and you can adapt fast to this to these um, changes right and uh, organic agility provides uh, a, a tool which is called organization scan which is a digital tool that will allow to create a um, cultural profile by collecting the the uh, stories from people about decisions that are taken in the company and how these decisions are making uh, made in the company because the culture of the company is not what is in the valley that are on the on the wall but it's it's what, what you can listen to the story that are told at the coffee machine. So, and, and we want to capture the story and the tool will allow you to, to create uh, uh, different heat maps uh, that analyze the different, part, the different elements of a culture because according to CVFF, the culture is determined by four different dimensions. One is the leadership behavior, Another one is the orientation, meaning, okay, how people naturally react when you drop, uh, when you drop a task on their table, are they uh, collaborating, are they start creating a plan and so on, and then theory of effectiveness, what people uh, uh, consider effectiveness, and then the value, the value drivers. And uh, of course, a coherent culture would, would have an overlapping of these heat maps, and, and we can see that the way we can influence this culture, it's not by creating a plan, uh, a culture, change program because this is a culture can be visualized but cannot be designed up front and cannot be changed to a program nevertheless it can be nudged into a certain direction by uh, shifting the leadership behaviors and through storytelling so in a, in a way and creating experiences as we can see the from the the pyramid of result so that we can create less stories like the one we don't want and more stories like the one we, we want. So this was just an overview. We will give you, we will send you more information in the, in the follow-up email and you can learn more in the, in the webinar focusing on principle number one. So let's go to principle number two. This is about situation decision making. So everything in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a organic agility or nothing in organic agility is right or wrong. Everything is about being coherent or incoherent uh, ab about the situation and of course you know also in the in when it comes to leadership there is no right or wrong uh, leadership behavior there's right, not right or wrong decision making process but there is also a right or wrong leadership behavior or the right or wrong decision making process depending on the context and depending on the cultural background of 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 the of your company how we 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 can decide the right approach to decision making by sense making the context and and of course we rely on Canavian framework which was created by Dave Snowden and by the way Dave Snowden was was a co-creator of organic agility and we used a lot of of uh, his theory um, and and cognitive edge is, is a partner of agile 42 so Canavian framework for those of you who does not know is a sense making uh, frame, uh, framework that you know divides the reality in four domains and Kinevin is a Welsh word that means habitat so you can you see you have some ordered domain on the right of the picture and some uh, unordered domain on the on the left side of the picture and here you have like the clear domain is where you know the relationship between cause and effect is is clear and obvious to everyone so this is the word of the best practices and the way you make decision there is just to you know, this is obvious, it's clear, so you just uh, should have a process to that. When it comes to complicated, here, you know, there is a relationship between cause and effect. It's still an unordered domain. There is a, a causality, but the, the relationship with cause and effect, it's, uh, it's not visible to everyone. So you need to have expertise. That's why, for instance, if you are in that domain, if you sense make that you are in that domain, and organic agility provide tools for sense making, uh, then the way you take decision is to uh, create a, a panel of, of specialists, have them 
create you know, uh, pros and cons and, and offer different options where the decision maker can, can, can pick and choose. But if you go on the unordered domain on the left side, uh, that's, that's not true anymore. There is the causality does not exist anymore because in the complex domain, um, um, the relationship between cause, cause and effect can only be seen uh, in, in a retrospective. Um, and um, so for this reason, there is no causality, then, but there might be correlation. And that's why there is no good or best practice, but there is just uh, emerging practice. And the way you can discover this kind of domain is to probe sense of response. So the way you can take a decision, what is the right thing to do in a complex environment is to maybe create a, multi, um, a set of multiple safe to fail experiment and then see how the system reacts and then decide what's the best, what the best approach. Because this is the domain of the unknown unknown and this is the domain of unintended consequences. And then we go to the chaotic domain, which is the domain where there's no constraint. It's the domain where there is no, no relationship at all between cause and effect. Think about you know, the COVID, uh, you know, uh, breakout, right? So this is the, 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 the domain of a, of, of a burning platform where, you know, you don't have time to edit it, but you need just to act, to put, up, put out the fire. So the way to take decision here is to take a draconian decision and everyone should follow because if there is a fire in your apartment or at your company, you are not, you know, deciding who agrees or who does not agree to, to escape, but you just follow the, the orders of, of people that are appointed to take decision in that. So by having a sense making of which domain you are, uh, you can use the, the, the proper decision making, uh, decision making approach. So let's go now to, to principle number three, focus on value creation, right? So, um, so let's have a look about what normally happens in traditional, in traditional organization. What happens in traditional organization is that these, organiz these, are, these companies are organized through departments, and these are just some examples, um, PMO or a certain subsystem that you have quality assurance, infrastructure operations, and so on. But how then, if you're organized like this, how do you then deliver value to your customer? You deliver value to your customer by creating projects that pick people uh, from different uh, lines or departments. And there are like, there's a need for endovers and coordination. And, uh, and then there is a push in the different lines uh, towards being efficient and producing more. And sometimes this efficiency optimization, it's probably sometimes going against the, the, the goal of the project to create value to, to, to the customer. And, uh, and then maybe you might have multiple projects um, and sometimes people are allocated to those projects and this is optimized for utilization. So think about what happens if you, at, at a certain moment, you have, uh, you need to, to, to go to a different market or you got a different client or you have to adapt, for instance, to deliver your value remotely. How, how probable is this setup you're gonna be fast and resilient, right? So actually what the principles suggest is that instead you start from what the value, uh, what, what, what is your customer, you make uh, um, uh, maybe um, an analysis of what are the personas you are serving, maybe you group this persona in, in, in customer groups, and then you are deciding what are the value that you are providing to this customer, and then you just organize around that. And you can organize in whatever you, you call streams of value stream, which are like, um, in a way, consistent and, and more permanent structure that are focusing to provide value to the customer. And then you try to map your existing capabilities to these different streams, but you make this different stream autonomous, as much autonomous as possible to deliver value to the customer. And actually, these also allow you quickly, if you have to adapt to new circumstances, to use what Dave Stoder calls acceptation strategy. So to quickly repurpose your existing capabilities, possibly to serve another client or to provide a different value or to respond to a different 
uh, market needs or even adapt to a different uh, market um, phase in the in the diffusion of innovation so actually you get something that it's optimized for value delivery and time to market so so what this principle suggests and we have tools for and organic agility provide tools for that like a, a value stream discovery um, and um, opportunity canvas tools that allow to 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 uh, like design your organization is in a way that is optimized for value delivery and then optimized for the for for resilience because you know the more uh, focus on the customer you have and the more autonomy you have in the different streams then of course the easiest will be for you and the faster will be for you to adapt to to, to different uh, circumstances and and of course once you have uh, uh, like have a, a coherent view of what is your your customer delivery then you can you can follow it up right and and this is examples for some of our customers this is sipgate where you know like all um business owners were, were gathering around the portfolio board for for aligning the decisions doing it very quickly and 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 quick and of course you know trying to have make sure that all the time the, the whole company is focused on the right thing and then this is another example from bubble and this is another example from 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 Siemens. I mean, you you, you have like a um, uh, million euro kind of work visualized on this company. So let's go to principle number four. So so once you have uh, understood your culture and and you you have a, an appropriate decision making framework, and you understand how you can deliver to the uh, with your customer how you can deliver value to your, your clients faster and more um, more effectively so how do you uh, move from there how do you evolve how you do you change how you do you continuously adapt um, and uh, probably if any of some of you know Kenevi and you, 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 you might understand that if you are changing something in a company you are in a complex domain because you know, this is something you have never done before, and and people are 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 coherent, uh, like um, uh, inherently um, complex. So you might understand you are in a complex domain. So you might already understand how you should do this. Nevertheless, how do companies normally do change in uh, approach change management? They approach change management the same way they approach uh, uh, delivery, right? So. So in a way that, you know, our company is a machine. So let's try to understand, you know, to do some nice upfront planning. Let's document everything. Uh, you know, then let's uh, create a rollout planning, fix all the cogs. And then, you know, of course, this is going to work. And then we're going to, uh, you know, use a hammer to fix anything and to push and to enforce everyone to follow the rules. Right. So, so it's very much doing a, like a large batch approach and focus on standardization before stabilization. And this is probably, in, in my experience, the number one um, um, reason why change um, fail in organization. If you just think about agile transformation, I mean, it's normally, like what normally happens is that you have an agile change department, agile change program, and then you have a number of coaches that are working very hard to create the specific company hand, agile handbook, uh, and maybe not only coaches, but also people who don't have any experience, and they create a perfect handbook that now that is standardized for everyone, so that everyone uh, can work the same, even if they've never worked uh, like this before. And now you push and enforce um, this to to everyone. I mean, if you, if it sounds some familiar, if this sounds familiar to some of you, you are welcome to give me. Uh, let's say a feedback in the chat, right? And, and this probably takes nine, 10 months, if even not more. And then at the end, if you think about the market life cycle, which is five to seven years, then after 12 months, you probably have to adapt again. And then it's already too late, right? So let me have a look at the chat. Yeah, it does perfectly, right? So yeah, I've seen this uh, as many of you. So what does uh, organic agility, uh, so if you create a change project, you are doing it wrong. So what does organic agility uh, uh, offers is that, you know, since Kenevin 
suggests that in a complex domain, you are supposed to, 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 to provide, you know, to, to run a, a set of uh, multiple safe to fail experiments. And that's how, how you run change. Like you, you must have a strategy, you must have a direction, a sense of direction to ensure coherence to one, towards the goal. But then you, you, you just pick one thing and then you try to, you know, uh, do an iterative incremental approach by designing some experiment, uh, run those experiments and then document it. And then, and then if, if the experiment is successful, then you implement it to the rest of the organization. If the experiment is not successful, you dampen the possible, uh, the possible effect. So this is a, an approach that is focused on stabilizing first and then standardize later because you first learn how to do it and then you try to, 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 to spread the learning to, to, to everybody. This is much safer approach and actually the only approach that makes sense in a, in a, in a, in a, in a complex environment. And, uh, and, uh, and in order for you to, to in a way govern this, this, this approach, and make sure that everyone is coherently aligned and coherently going towards the same direction. Organic Agility provides uh, a tool that is, a, again, also a digital tool that is called Agile Strategy Map. And Agile Strategy Map doesn't mean that, that it's a strategy map for Agile transformation, but it's just an Agile way to, to run strategy. Because, you know, what we, in the pure sense of agility, right? that is be able to adapt fast to changing circumstances and be able to experiment fast. And of course, in order to be able for a company to systematically embrace the, the ability uh, that, uh, to experiment, then of course you should have a culture that is, is ready for that. So that's why usually when we approach a company, we always start with a culture assessment to see like whether um, uh, the culture is prepared, otherwise you should intentionally work on the culture to make it a little, a little bit more enabling uh, exper fast experimentation, right? And also this creates um, collaboration, ownership about strategy, because, you know, the only way you can make sure that people are uh, willing fully going towards a certain direction is to create a sense of ownership. So let's quickly go then to last principle which is optimizing the flow right so once we have created this value stream we need to optimize the flow and make sure that we remove all um, um, unnecessary synchronization of flow and i must say that while all the other principles are more based on complexity theory and complexity science this is probably the only principle that is more based on on uh, uh, system thinking and, le and lean thinking because when you once you have achieved um, you know, what is uh, suggested from the first five, four principles, then you are probably more in a complicated domain. So it's much more appropriate to use lean thinking and system thinking. So, and, and again, if you have a look about how normal organization uh, happens, you know, you normally have uh, one or two releases a year, and then you have multiple projects that um, uh, have to align towards this delivery and this project have dependencies and you have project managers or product owner running around and try to coordinate and make sure that everyone is aligned and then we have our, uh, you know, great release and uh, hopefully maybe some uh, nice uh, uh, big planning, right? And of course, this synchronization decreases uh, efficiency, it increases coordination cost and decreases uh, resilience and adaptability. What we should do instead is to give autonomy also on a team level and have the ability, uh, have the infrastructure be the architecture be the, have the right skills and the right skill set to, to be able to deliver uh, value to, to customer um, whenever it's needed. And um, so the desynchronization of teams reduce the cost of release. And this is an example about how, you know, we achieve this etheric zone um, uh, in, in Italy uh, about, uh, uh, you know, like through automating testing and continuous delivery and continuous in integration. So I would say that this is all for it. Um, I hope I give you um, like a, a good uh, overview of this. So I would like to leave the, um, uh, the stage to to Fia to give you more information. Maybe have a a, a, a question answer session.
Thank you, Giuseppe. This was a really, really interesting uh, presentation from you. And uh, I'm now going to let people put any questions in the Q&A. And if you have any comments, please also feel free now to use the chat for this and we will take them uh, as soon as you have given us some questions. Uh, there will be now the upcoming webinar uh, is uh, on the 22nd. Of May, so keep that in mind. We will post more info on this when we have it. Uh, next week, there will be an interview with Dave Snowden, also by Giuseppe. So if you feel interesting, interested in knowing more also about complexity-based design thinking, please join us then. These links will all be uh, in the email for you. So don't worry, uh, they are coming. <clears throat> And then from June on, of course, there will be more, uh, more webinars. Uh, one question I already had in the q and is if Agile 42 is looking for virtual organic agility training classes. And as you can see here on the slide, we already have the remote trainings up and running. Uh, and also, if you want to, you can take a three hour uh, online course to also get the certified Agile leadership uh, certification on top of the organic Agility Foundation training. So uh, these uh, are the dates. So May, uh, we have the first set, and then in June, we have two trainings coming up. So uh, please feel free also to join these, and also this link with the trainings will be uh, in the email. So also, if you want to learn more about organic agility, there are many ways to do this. Uh, a training is a good example. The webinars uh, upcoming are also giving you some triggers to this. Uh, there's a website where you can read more. Uh, there's the organic agility book that you can order from Amazon. You can have it as a paper book or as a Kindle version. So this is also uh, good if you want to do some reading. Um, case studies are available and so on. So uh, please have a look at this and you can always reach out to, to me or Giuseppe also if you have any questions and we are happy to direct you to the right, to the right places where you can find more information. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the, the questions that have come in. Uh, the first one was already a little bit in the beginning of the webinar. Can you share an experience of achieving the metaphor shift in an organization that was quite robust to such a shift in the beginning? Yeah, um, thanks for the questions. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, I think I, I, man I mentioned a little bit um, something, but I will give a, a better example. Because the way we approach this company that, that you, 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 you saw, these are all quite big company that were really like, um, you know, having a, an initial culture that was very much skewed towards, towards the, 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 the hierarchy, towards the, the control, right? So, so the first thing that we do is really to start from an organizational assessment for a cultural assessment that makes this visible, right? And say, okay, hey guys, you want to innovate? Then we present you this model. You understand that if you want to innovate, uh, you have to have a culture that is most maybe skewed more more upwards so and you have this culture what do you think you can do and then and then you know this create awareness and create uh, like commitment also that hey you know it's not just about like implementing some new tools or some new framework it's about like uh, shifting this and then and then the and then the next step would be not to make a plan to go from point a from point b but to, to understand, looking at the natural disposition of the system, uh, because that's what you do with organs, right? So if you, uh, I usually make this metaphor of parenting, that uh, if you want to, to teach something, if you want to, to change your, your kids' behavior, for instance, you want them to, to learn about, uh, um, for instance, to collaborate with each other, then you are not putting value in their uh, bedrooms and say, yeah, you have to collaborate or, or you uh, uh, give him KPI, but you try to use his natural disposition. So if he likes sports, maybe you put him in a football team so they can have the experience and learn, or if he likes music, maybe you put him in an ensemble. And the same thing, since it's the same an organ as you do with an organization. So you don't create video, you don't push video, but you create new experiences and you are looking what is called addition, next addition possible. So you look at the heat maps and then you see, okay, how can we move to this point A to the closest meaningful point? And what can we do to create less story like the one that we don't know and more story like the one that are in this, uh, in this point? 
And then you do this by creating experiences so that, and, and basically this is the same as creating safe to fail experiment so that people, um, you know, can, can learn these new things and then they can create new beliefs. And then by shifting this culture a little bit, you make them more, more uh, uh, um, suitable to experiment and then you start from there, right? So that's what we normally, we start from cultural assessment and then, you know, do certain intervention that it might be um, then strategy map and so on. But of course, in order for you to shift this behavior, it requires to shift leadership behaviors first. So that's why organic agility uh, always starts with uh, education for, for leaders. So we have like uh, foundation classes that we also sell, sell public, but we also have uh, advanced classes uh, because you know, the leaders need to understand this thing very well in order for them to be able to adjust their behavior appropri appropriately so that by adjusting their behavior, they can adjust uh, what people experience because the leaders are part of people experience. So the, well, the people experience, so by changing the stories of success or failure, we change what people believe works that doesn't work. And in the end, we're gonna change value drivers. So this is usually the approach and this is the approach that has been proved already um, for, for some years now, because even though Organic Agility was uh, developed uh, three years ago when we had our innovation sprint with Dave Snowden, I mean, this is like uh, just a, um, a conceptualization of methods and principles we have been using since Agile for to started 13 years ago. So I hope I answered your question somehow. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me via email or whatever. You, you find my contact in the, in the presentation. I will be happy to continue this conversation with you. Uh, Super. Yep. Then there is also a, another question about the slides and the video, if they will be available online. And I can probably answer this one. Yes, uh, they will be available online on YouTube and also out throughout our social media, media network. So uh, we will share this with you also in the post email. So you have it. So no worries on that. Then there is another question about uh, the tool for the culture scanning. Uh, is that different to the sense maker tool from Cognitive Edge doing the same, but just in a different tool? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is based on the same technology uh, um, that is sense maker. So sense maker is the technology that is, is used in the org scan. The organization scan is, is a, an application of sense maker. You can say that uh, organizational scan is an application of sense maker to uh, cultural and organizational change, right? So this is specialized for, 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 for that specific reason, because with a sense maker, you can do uh, basically anything. And actually we are also developing, uh, soon we will develop a, um, a pulse a scan on, uh, for a leadership behavior assessment. We are we're going to, to, to create a, a, also a scan uh, for, um, for a team assessment. So actually by changing the, the signifiers, you can actually do anything. We, we actually just now created also a, a, a pulse to, to probe a little bit our clients about how they are uh, dealing with the COVID breakout so that we can create a report and make it available to the, to the uh, so, so it's the same technology, but it's different um, application and the Cognitive Edge has dozens of different applications as well. And then there is also another question. Uh, I would like to ask Giuseppe if he could give us a specific example of a company project managed in an agile way so we can better understand the approach. Uh, Roberta, do you think I answered uh, your question uh, uh, also by answering the previous question about uh, how you can deal the, how you can have the approach? Yes. yes. Okay. So okay. Roberta is happy. Okay. And again, feel free. <laughs> I saw that. I saw read that you are connected with me on LinkedIn. Super. Very happy. So let's keep uh, the conversation. And I'm happy to answer more questions. And of course, you know, I into uh, I, I did a, a Cal Organic Agility Foundation Cal Monday Tuesday this week. Of course, if you are two days talking about these things, that there, there, there's much more. And then there are advanced classes as as well. And so there's a lot of, and actually we have uh, the, the book that you see the link and you are welcome to, to buy it on, a, on Amazon. Um, that's gonna give you a, a also an, um, like pretty much exhaustive explanation of what this is about. Yeah, um, 
for now, I don't see any more questions. Uh, also, the chat is not anymore uh, filling up with questions. It's more filling up with thank yous. Uh, thank you also for, for participating in this webinar. We had a lot of, of people here. It was really, really nice to see you all. Um, I think we can end the webinar for now. Uh, and we hope we see you in May again, uh, or also next week. Uh, together with Dave Snowden. So stay tuned for the email. It's going to come as soon as possible to you with links and, and stuff so you can, you can follow up on that. And let us know if you have anything we can help you with. Yeah, let me thank just you, thank, Giuseppe. Let me just thank everyone for the great feedback and the rewarding comments I, I see on the chat. So really appreciate it that you appreciate it. So <laughs> have a good day. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.